Welcome to the Eye on Annapolis Local Business Spotlight. There are thousands of locally owned businesses in the area, some small and some large. Some you may know and others you don't. But one thing they all have in common is a great story, and we want to share it with you. Join us every Saturday as we talk to the founders, the owners, and the managers of local businesses you have come to know and love, and those you will come to know and love. Now here's your host, John Frenet, with this week's Local Business Spotlight. All right, we're over here at the Annapolis Mall, which is very weird for me because I typically don't like the mall. But when you are invited to come to see the studio at Live Arts Maryland and see some music going on, uh, you don't turn that one down. And we are sitting here today with Jay Ernest Green, who is the conductor. Conductor, artistic director. Artistic yeah. director. And do you prefer Jay Ernest or do you prefer Ernie? Well, you know, we're Ernest. casual here. We're very casual. So Ernie is fine. Jay Ernest, Jay Ernest <laughs> is the official, um, but we're friends and we're casual. So, you know. Well, as you know, Ernie is fine. We have crossed paths for probably 15 years. Absolutely. And, um, we have not really had time to really sit down and talk and develop a friendship and stuff like that, which I really am I'm kind of sad about. I'm hoping that this is the beginning <laughs> of, but you you and I were actually talking just before uh, COVID, COVID hit. Yep. We were talking, I remember talking to you in January of, uh, of 2020, and I was trying to figure out a couple things about some marketing thing and like you published something and I remember thinking, Ooh, I got to reach out to him. And then, oh, yeah. Then the world ended. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> As we know it, it ended. Exactly. Um. Well, I mean, you are most known in the area as the conductor of Live Arts Maryland, which is a series of different organizations within the organization. Right. right. And as I look at your biography, I mean, you're a lot more. I mean, you've won a Lifetime Achievement Award from the uh, Anne Arundel County Arts. I think they thought I was older than I actually am. Okay. <laughs> well, at least you're still living. You know, okay. When, okay. When I left, you know, when I said, <laughs> accepted the award, I said, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, deeply embedded in the museum. Most recently, you brought Paul Schaefer from Late Night with David Letterman right. here to showcase his talents along with your talents. Right. And the talents of everybody that you work with at Maryland Hall, which right. was an absolutely fantastic show. Thank you. We had a the, great, time, great time. Uh and you know, I don't I don't know. You were going up against Stevie Nicks and man, you held it. I'm telling you. <laughs> you know what? And you know, it's funny because um, one of the guitar players in that concert is Mick Fleetwood's uh guitarist and music director. Oh my gosh. So yeah, so he was actually he had to actually leave instead we had a concert in the Midwest. He lives in Maui. And he had to fly back because he had two dates with Mick on the islands. So, oh. And then he had to fly back when we did a concert two weeks later in Toledo. Well, I'll tell you, if anybody does didn't see the show, you missed it. It was a great show. I don't know when it would come back again, but uh, it was entertaining as hell. It was funny. It was, I mean. Thank you. You know, the way you held the music together. I mean, Paul was entertaining. I mean, he was, uh, you know funny and you know when he dropped the music when he, you know just the stories and everything else is just absolutely wonderful well job well done thank you well and you know working with paul, paul is, is like one of the greatest guys you know i've been i've been very fortunate to work with two sort of mega musical personalities and both of them have been extraordinary people as well and paul is just a great we've become really good friends over the years you know we have a good time together and i think that translates in the performances it, it certainly does. And I mean, you could tell there was some friendship back back yeah. and forth between there as well. And the other, well, you said two mega personalities. I mean, I guess the other one was Marvin Hamlish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was the same way, you know, it was a different personalities, but, but, you know, both of these guys to me represent sort of the pinnacle of popular music in America. We are here in Annapolis and I want to talk about Live Arts Maryland and the okay. website is liveartsmd.org. Right. Makes it very easy. And the mall, I've got to say, is an odd place for this. Oh, yeah. But I just read this morning in the Wall Street Journal about the nation's oldest mall outside of Minneapolis that is being repurposed. It's not the Mall of America. It's another okay. one right. that is being repurposed. And it said it has the gym. It has performance venues. Right. It has right. everything else. And right. the Annapolis Mall is repurposing. I mean, we've got... Yeah. We've got the SBCA here. We've got the library. Right. We've got a gym. We've got a kids resort that's getting ready to open right. up. And we've got Live Arts Maryland, right. which is a performance venue right here in right. the mall. And for those that are wondering where it is, it's on the back side of the mall. You sort of go in the mall entrance to the left of the container store and then just go left and it's right. right there. You know, and, and when we uh, when we started this, uh, we actually were 
in where, the store where Offenbacher's is. You know, L- Live Arts Maryland is, uh, when you talk about this sort of website with the web address, we changed our name and we rebranded. The group was originally the Annapolis Corral, but we started doing more things with the orchestra and we have a chamber chorus and we did a concert series and it got very confusing to our audience. So the idea is that Live Arts is sort of an umbrella under which we have the Annapolis Corral, which is the big chorus. Before the pandemic, it was about 175. Now it's about 120 something. The chamber chorus of the corral, uh, a women's chorus called Contori, the Bach Plus series, where we, we most of our performances are at St. Anne's. And believe it or not, you know, I always make a joke when I do the pre concert welcome here at the studio. You, you don't think you're going to go see a concert in the mall. You know, you go to the mall, you think you're going to the container store, you're going to go to buy, you know, t shirts, you know, shoes or something like that. And a pretzel and Anna Annie. Yeah, pretzel and Anna. <laughs> That's a, I almost bought one yesterday. But um, you don't think about going to a concert. And when I approached a friend of mine who was one of the vice presidents for leasing for Unibail, the company that owns the uh, Westfield or owned Westfield, I said, I've got this idea. I've been chewing on it for years. And now that we're in the middle of the pandemic, I, I want to bring it to you about using one of the empty spaces and putting on concerts. And I really thought I was going to get the blow off, the big blow off. And instead, the mall embraced it immediately. They've been very supportive. They helped us get this space cleared out. This place was just a hot mess when we took possession of it. And it's it's really been, it's been a learning process for us, I'm sure for them. But, you know, this last week we had two performances with really good houses. And one of them was a jazz performance with a singer and a trio. The other was chamber music where we had two singers, a dancer, and a pianist playing Schubert and Boreyeston's music and woven together in a tapestry. To That's wild. A story. It's, That's it's wild. crazy. I, two nights in a row. I mean, I mean, as I look around this room, and I mean, it's it's a great room. It's a large room. There's plenty of room. Uh, you know, God forbid COVID strikes again. You, you've got plenty of room to spread out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Certainly, the capacity is probably several hundred, but I mean, you know, I'd probably say a hundred easily. Yeah, we have an occupancy capacity of 299. We sort of try to max out performances in the 150 range-ish just because it's more comfortable. And some of the sight lines, you know, get a little little wonky. Well, I I will say that, I mean, this is very similar to like colonial players and that there is no bad seat in the house as I live around here. I mean, you're up close, you're up close personal. I mean, it's not a Maryland Hall performance that is, you know, 30 rows away. Right, right. Well, and and Maryland Fall, you know, one of the reasons that we did this was I did not want sort of a black box theater. I wanted something where we could be flexible. So, for instance, the uh, the listeners can't see this, but we changed the performing area as needed. So, for instance, we will periodically do things in the round, like Colony. Um, we'll do sort of three-quarter round right here. With the audience sort of wrapped. interesting. Every now and then, if we have something where we want a more traditional look, we'll set chairs up facing this way and the performers there. So it's really looks like, you know, like a, a mini concert venue, a, a mini right? concert venue. And then we have this giant horseshoe for rehearsals with the chorus. This changeover happens two or three times a week. So wild. Yeah, it's crazy. Really a flexible space yeah. and really accommodates anything you need. Now, Live Arts Maryland. Okay, you said you've got the chamber orchestra. Yep, that is the chamber orchestra. You've got the chorale. Chorale. And what is the difference between that, just size? The chamber orchestra is probably, we typically run in the 30 to 35 to 40. And, and I make a point of doing, for the most part, different repertoire than you would see with the uh, symphony, for instance. Because my, my feeling is... There is plenty of music out there for us to, con- you know, we can focus on the chamber orchestra repertoire. They can focus on the symphonic repertoire and we don't ever have to overlap and create a conflict. And then we have the Annapolis Chorale, which is a big civic chorus. Pre-COVID was about 175. Now it's in the 120s-ish okay. range. And then we have a chamber chorus of about 35 to 40. And again, that's just a size difference, right? Right, just a size difference. And With the size difference also comes different choices about which repertoire you perform. Okay. So smaller chorus generally is going to be a repertoire that is, I tend to focus it more towards repertoire that requires smaller performing forces in the orchestra. So I wouldn't, for instance, have the 30 members of 
the chamber chorus or 40 members do, for instance, a Verdi Requiem where the orchestra is 45 or 50, where we've expanded the chamber orchestra and added extra players. So you want to, you want to use those groups, uh, and, and find their sweet spot, uh, okay. which is always elusive and always changing. <laughs> For sure. What, what is the difference between the symphony? Okay. We've got the Annapolis Symphony Orchestra right. in, in town. I mean, Annapolis is just a wonderful arch town. Right. They've it got really is. So much, I mean, the depth of it, go explore it and you'll be absolutely amazed. Absolutely. What is the difference between its size? I mean, mostly size. Does the symphony size. say you have to have X number of? No, but it's you know there's there's sort of this. It, it has the orchestra evolved from its beginnings to where where we are now. The modern term symphony orchestra, the philharmonic, you know, all these names. They're just different ways of naming the same thing. And a symphony orchestra is usually larger, and for the most part, not not entirely, but for the most part, concentrates on big what we call symphonic repertoire. This is big repertoire, typically from the Romantic era, somewhere around maybe the 1820s, 1830s and beyond, where the, the requirements to play that repertoire became more extensive. You know, if you're playing Rachmaninoff, you might need three clarinets instead of two and two bassoons and a contrabassoon instead of two bassoons. Okay. When we do Bach, for instance, we'll do, we have uh, this performance on March 29th. When we do that, I'll do that with two flutes, two oboes, strings, a bassoon, uh, and a gamba player. What's it called? Uh, it's a predecessor to the cello. Okay. So it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. And that's it. So it's much smaller. And I'm doing it with 17 players. 17 okay. players or 18 players as opposed to the 40 players we're going to use for the choral concert at the end of the year or 45 players. So okay. we, we, I sort of tell people you have to think of it like an accordion. If we need to get bigger... We get bigger. If we need to get smaller, we get smaller. That makes sense. And so, so the advantage of being, um, and I see this in, in other sort of applications, one of the advantages of being in a situation like we are is there's virtually no genre of music that we can't do because of size constraints. Usually with a big orchestra, there are limits. If you have a big orchestra under contract, you can't say, oh, we're contracting 75 players for the season and then use 20 and 15 and then 18 and then 20. We start small, we can get bigger and add, and then get smaller again. So we can do the same with the chorus. You know, if I want to do a Mozart Requiem, I can say, okay, am I going to do this with the full chorus of 100, or am I going to do it with the chamber chorus of 30? And so I can use those different ensembles to make artistic choices. To me, that's one of the beauties of what we do. Well, I mean, as, as I'm listening to you describing what you're putting together, really does sort of bring whole the artistic director into this. Because, I mean, there's a lot more than just uh, waving a stick. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there really is. <laughs> Which I thought, I'm, I'm like, you know, all he's doing is just being a boss waving just that stick waving around, stick. Pointing, pointing fingers at somebody. Yeah. And, and, the, and the job can, ch you know, it can evolve. For instance, it's different in different times. The most important thing that I do, aside from, um, I mean, some people say, oh, you know, conducting and doing rehearsals. And things you like heard that. cats. Huh? You've probably heard, heard cats. cats. I have a lot of cats to hurt. <laughs> but what I feel like my job is, is I'm, I'm constantly looking for pieces of music that will be interesting, viable, get people connected with what we do so that we're not doing the same stuff over and over. There are so many groups that are literally, you can look at the programs from 20 years ago and they're virtually the same as they are today. And there's so much music out there. So for instance, the concert we're doing on June 1st, I think, it's the end of our season. It's very late for us. We're doing a setting of the Tedeum by Bruckner. It's a big, a romantic work. It's big orchestra, big chorus. And it is over the top in terms of scale and what we do with it. And then we are doing right next to it, the Carl Jenkins Gloria. Carl Jenkins is sort of this uh, orchestral crossover composer from the UK. He um, actually played in the British progressive rock band uh, Soft Machine oh. in the 70s. Um, and so and he's, he's a really interesting composer. He brings a lot of world music elements. Uh, we've done pieces where he brings in the Japanese bamboo flute, the shakuhachi. And there are places in this where... There are readings in different languages that, that are sort of short 20 second readings that deal with the idea of the world coming together to celebrate and build. So I'm putting the Carl Jenkins, which was written 15 years ago, right next to Bruckner, which is 100, 100 years ago. And, and this way it gives the audience a chance to go, 
oh, I get it. There's more here than meets the eye. There really is. Does Live Arts Maryland, with the different ensembles that you have under that umbrella, have a season? We do. We do. We absolutely do. We're kind of a little bit of a, well, I'm going to say we're a renegade. I'm not actually sure we are, but I'm going to say we are. because it's not, a, not a bad moniker. Because then it, then, it, then it makes me feel like, oh, we're really doing something hip. But um, over the last, it was starting before the, the pandemic hit. We were moving away from the traditional subscription model, and we were moving towards a model of curating and promoting and getting people to attend and connect with concerts on a concert-by-concert concert basis. What I started feeling like over the last, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 years is that people were more and more reluctant to commit to a whole season all at once. And we did have some people, and we still do, who are subscribers. They like Write that check in January. Yeah, write that <laughs> check, boom, done. But what we also see is that people are very interested in impulse buys. They'll see something we're doing. They might go, ooh, that looks really cool. And so we've started pushing our approach into single ticket buyers and individual ticket sales. You know, the conventional wisdom 15, 20 years ago was, oh my God, don't do that because you have no security. You're just going to be in the doghouse. And while it's a little riskier on some ways, what it's really done is it's, it's helped us to change the face of our audience. We're starting to gradually, but it's slow, slow. But we're starting to see an audience that's a little younger and more focused on the music we're playing than... Well, I sit there and I think about it. You're absolutely right. I mean, if you turn around and you say, okay, we're doing um, you know, a classical composer, right. who's, that's going to be... You know, I'll, I'll stereotype, but an older audience is right. going to come there. It's right. going to be the 50 up crowd. Right, right. Uh, you bring in Paul Schaefer here. That's now brought you down probably to the 30s. Right. I mean, Mike, right. a 20 year old, they're going, right. who? Yeah, <laughs> you know? right. Well, and, and that's it. And the other thing it does, I mentioned earlier, I talked about the idea that, that we have these ensembles that work sort of independently. So I can say, okay, I want to do this piece. Which chorus do I want to do it with? How will that chorus do justice to the music in a way that the audience has got? I want the audience to walk out. And this is going to sound almost like blasphemy. I don't really care if the audience has learned something, doesn't learn something, makes no difference to me. What I really care about is that they had a good experience and that they, they get to the end of the concert. They go, okay, that was really cool. We're living in a world now, and I think we're seeing a, a, a global transition, mm -hmm. and, and I, I will credit COVID for this. I find that a lot of people are much more focused on experiences Experience, absolutely. than stuff. I can walk down to Macy's here in the store and, and buy the latest polo shirt or, or, right. or you know Gucci shoes. Right. I don't know whether they sell them or whatever, you know, but that's not important to me right. anymore. Uh, the importance is that I can sit there for an hour or two hours or whatever. So right. I was just speaking with the folks at the Annapolis Film Festival. And that, right. you know, it's, it's all about right. a shared experience. Right. When you come into the Annapolis Corral, when you come into a show that Live Arts Maryland is putting on, you're sitting there with, you know, maybe, maybe 50, maybe a hundred, maybe 200, maybe 600, maybe mm -hmm. 750 people at, right. at capacity Maryland Hall. And right. you're all sharing that experience. Right. I take that so seriously. And, I, you know, I, I sort of joke, you know, now you get to be in your 60s and you start thinking about things differently. And I think like all young musicians, I was a little maybe glib or cavalier about the audience and, you know, the, the fact that we need the audience to survive. And, I, and everybody does that. You know, every musician at certain times in their lives is a little dismissive. I feel a tremendous responsibility to the audience that we have to make sure that whatever I do, that I am finding a way to give them something that is unique in that moment. So when you come here and you see a jazz vocalist with a trio one night, and then you come the next night and you see a chamber music concert, or we had a cello recital two weeks ago, or we had a children's piano recital also in here. The idea is trying to make things accessible for people in unique ways. And I kind of love the idea People come into these concerts. I love the idea of being able to go get a glass of wine and sit at the table with your glass of wine and listen to a concert. That's fantastic. Isn't well, that great? I mean, one of the greatest things in the world. When Maryland Hall got rid of that stupid rule of the school side, they can't serve booze in there. And they, oh, they're yeah. able to, are you able to serve alcohol in here? Yeah. Yeah. We get a, we have a liquor license. We get a liquor license 
every single concert. So, uh, except for concerts, which we've only had one of those actually. Okay, so it's as a nonprofit, you get it for the the event. Yeah, we get it for the event. We we actually. So I can't come in here and drink at night. No, no, uh, but you know, but if you want, I can show you where the wine is. As long as, as long as I'm not selling it, you're not buying it. We can drink this. We can drink ourselves silly right now. Um, we also, for some concerts, sometimes we have uh, snacks available, and it varies. We don't make a big deal of it because we don't want people to have expectations. We want to surprise you. When you cut, like, for instance, what you know, somebody, one of our members, makes the most delightful macarons which I love, those wonderful little French cookies with a little filling on the inside. And um, we had something the other week, and all of a sudden there were her macarons, and I'm like, oh, this was a, this was a bad thing to <laughs> bring. But so there's a little bit of whimsy. And to me, that, to, to me, that idea of doing things in a way that is like classical music, we can call what we do anything. We, the term today, the term of art is classical music. It doesn't matter that the classical era in music was only about 60 years long, and it was a narrow band uh, around the time Mozart and Haydn and early Beethoven were around. We use the term classical music to refer to everything that has an orchestra or is not pop. Sure. But, well, terms always change, too. Yeah, they're, they're, exactly. they're calling you two oldies. Exactly. <laughs> well, I said to somebody the other day, somebody said, I said, oh, yeah, we were, when I was in Toledo, we were talking about uh, some, some tunes from the 70s. And I'm like, God, man, it doesn't seem that long ago. It's like 30 years, right? And one of the people who, who works with Paul said, and we we're all, it was all old guys right, talking right, right. about this music that we grew up with. And she said, uh, hello, that would be 50 years ago. <laughs> and we're like, oh, I can't believe Yeah, it. you need to leave now. <laughs> I can't believe you said that to us. That was horrible. <laughs> but I think the classical music world has, has become sort of stratified or we're sort of you know, petrified, if you will. And, you know, we, we try to create whimsy by doing little sort of little things that they're just sort of lip service. So what we want to do here is, and the, actually the plans for next year for this space, in terms of what we're going to program, I'm already working on that. And we're going to look at transforming this space for different types of performances. In the spring, for instance, I'm putting the entire corral, all 125 of them in here. We're going to do a chamber concert with the piano. And we're going to do music that was, you won't get to hear anywhere else. Because it's not stuff that'll fit at St. Anne's. It's not necessarily stuff that'll fit at Maryland Hall. But boy, in a place like this, could we tear it up? How do you do as far as traffic? I mean, I got to think with... Well, you know, it's, it's very interesting. I've started to say this to you. One of my great joys about this place is that last night, and again, it happens like happened last night. We have people, when we're rehearsing, that hear us hear the music and they oh, peek through the door and they don't just stick their head and open the door and leave. They come in. I had a guy come in last night, stand right there, right where that, that table with awesome. the mixing board is. And actually, we had two other people come in. We were uh, doing some recording with the women last night at the end of rehearsal and came. It was just, it's just like looking at people come. Sometimes we get kids that come in and you know i i used to love it when you you'd get kids that would come in and little girls would come in and twirl while we were singing you know and and when we first started doing this um i had people say well should we lock the door and i'm like no <laughs> no <laughs> are you kidding don't lock the door let them in because to me you know I, I i just love it i just love it we had somebody that came in one time was walking by the mall heard us we were doing an open mic night here and they heard us and they were like Oh, I, I just heard this beautiful music and I wanted to see what it was. And they were standing over there. I said, well, you know, do you, do you sing? Do you want to sing? I said, oh, I haven't sung in, in like 15 years. I said, well, do you know a piece of music? We can see if the pianist could play for you. And they sang. It was the first time in 15 years that they'd sung. Beautiful voice. You know, that one person went out of here, in my, to my mind, I like to think that that person went out and they went out changed. They didn't go out of the room the same way they came in. Ernie Green and Live Arts Maryland just totally brought something, an experience that he hadn't had in 15 years, Tony. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I'm thinking, this is what it should be about. You know, the music world is so often about buy a ticket, come in the door, sit down, shut up, we're all done, go home. What if we changed that? What if we made it interactive? And one of the things I love about this, um, we, we did a Christmas cabaret after the holiday concert. And we had Mark Berman, who is a pianist for Mrs. Maisel, and 
you know, Mark's a pretty, pretty big mover and shaker of the New York Jazz. He's a good friend of mine. And um, when we did this concert, we were laughing because the way the scene for the audience was, he was playing piano right here. There were people sitting here and he goes, he goes, you know, they could like, you know, play the piano with me. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, they actually could. So I was sitting in the seat <laughs> and, you know, to get that close and be able to see and you get to, you get to interact. I mean, there's no hiding here. It's, there's no hiding. It's something special when you, when you get that and you yeah. realize yeah. that you say, okay, you make music. I mean, right. when you are up close, you know, when you're at a distance, it's hard to see. Yeah. When you're up close, you realize you can get the tonality yeah. and everything else. I, yeah. I remember one time I was at a uh, work festival at Merriweather. Oh, yeah. And ZZ Top was one of the, oh, the headliners. Wow. And there were some kids sitting next to me and they're like, it dawned on them. We were fairly up close and they're like, they're really playing. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, what do you think? They come out with they're, these pink fuzzy things and just like sort track. of air guitar? Yeah, no, Billy Gibbons is not and, playing on it. You know, and it, again, that opened up the world to it. I mean, what yeah. you do, I mean, you look at that work for it, had all sorts, you know, had ZZ Top, yeah. had the Screamer guys. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I don't like it, but I mean, I get it. But you know what? You have to, you have to be willing, I think, you have to be willing to experience the full spectrum. Yeah, it's like I, I had this conversation with somebody not long ago, and they were very entrenched in their ways in terms of what music they liked, what they didn't like, how, you know, and you know, I realized that I wasn't getting anywhere. And so I sent them some recording links and I haven't heard back from them yet, but I sent some recordings. I said, listen, take a listen to this and tell me what you think. You know, here are, I was like four or five things. I said, just take a listen and let me know. Let me know if you like, if you don't like any of them, just say, I thought they were all terrible. I didn't like it. And I haven't heard back yet, but I, I will be surprised if there is not uh, some kind of, wow, that was kind of interesting because it's a matter of exposure. You know, you know, we all like moaned and complained the first time we had to eat something that we hadn't seen before. And, right. you know, you would have thought we were going to die. Yeah. I mean, you know, I remember growing up, I mean, I thought it was like worthy of communicating with the Geneva convention people, but my mother would make Brussels sprouts, <laughs> you know, <Maybe>. everywhere, <laughs> everywhere you go. <laughs> They got Brussels sprouts on the menu. Right. They're everywhere. You know, they're crispy Brussels sprouts, which to me are kind of a mystery, but I'm going to try. And, you know, I always, I always also say this, you know, everybody doesn't have to like Brussels sprouts. It's okay to say you don't like this kind of music, but you can only say it if you try it or this kind of art. And that, that's the thing. And it's experience, you know? Absolutely fair. It's experience. We've been to see, my, my wife is a huge theater goer. And so um, we go see stuff a lot in D.C. now. And we don't love everything. You know, we're pretty savvy about what we pick. But, you know, you don't love everything. But you got to check it out because it's the experience. And that gives you perspective for the next thing you see. And you do. And, and you know, personally, for me, I'm not a huge opera fan. Yeah. Uh, and I find it, it's just my mind doesn't work because I right. can't. I, I want to see what's happening. I want to listen to the right. music. But then I've got to read the thing up top yeah. just to see. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I just can't do yeah. the whole thing. And I, and I tried it and, I, and it's, it's just not my thing. Well, like, yeah. oh yeah, absolutely. It's mm -hmm. again, it's an experience, it's a shared experience with mm -hmm. friends or family to be right. able to, to do it there. A question for you though. I mean, you're the guy that's up front. You're waving the baton and being the boss man and right. pointing, pointing the, pointing the little stick at people and right. making them do things. I have seen a resurgence in actually the film industry recently. I mean, you've got Chevalier, you've got, um, the conductor maestro, right? Certainly, which is near and, uh, tar. Right. A couple of years ago. Right. I'm like, wow, man, you know, this, uh, yeah. that, that conductor thing is. Yeah, it's uh, I, I this is one of these times I have not. I have to confess, I have not seen Tar or Maestro. And the conversation about those movies, we there's, there was a, usually a joke, especially when conductors, if you if you were working as a cover conductor, which basically means you're the insurance policy for the orchestra. And what's interesting about being a cover conductor is you almost never appear in the program for the orchestra. If you look at an orchestra listing, you see the music director, maybe the associate music director, maybe an assistant conductor, something like this. Right. You see all these things here. And then there's this mysterious cover conductor that doesn't appear anywhere in print. And it's sort of right up in here because you're the guy who has to be able to walk in if somebody gets bad shellfish. Okay. And you need to be able to do it on a moment's notice. But the, the joke is always, you know, 
you know, if you see two conductors in the same room at the same time, one of them is dead or about to be, you know, <laughs> but, um, but in, in all seriousness, I have a couple friends and colleagues who I'm, I've sort of, we started off as conducting fellows at Peabody in the eighties and studying conducting back then is to, in my mind, at least is very different than it is today in terms of what is emphasized, what's, you know, what the focus of your work is. So I have colleagues and we sort of talk and we're all a little bit guarded about seeing Maestro. Or t- you know, Maestro, it seems to me from what I've heard, I, and I probably will watch that because that one is sort of interesting, but it really focuses more on the salacious natures of Bernstein being, you know, bisexual. And, you know, you know, you see him working with a student uh, in one scene and they're in bed the day. I don't, you right. know. And, you know, honestly, that to me is fine, but it doesn't have to be a conductor to have that same story. I mean, you sure. can have that same story about sure. anybody. And so there is a mystique about being a conductor. And what I always tell people is the mystique only really happens if you do the work to get you there. Because the work, this morning I got up, I was, I was working on getting ready to do ragtime with Toledo Opera. Last year I did their Merry Widow. I've got a South Pacific of them next season. And so I got up and I'm working on ragtime. And in between that ragtime, a ragtime and uh, another meeting, I, I put that away. I went to this other meeting. I came back and I was working on the, the, the music for the box St. John. So in order for the mystique to really be there, you got to put the work in. And it's just a lot of work. You spend a lot of time by yourself at your desk working on music, trying to figure it out. You said you went to Berkeley. Um, no, Peabody. Or Peabody, sorry. Yeah. I know, it's probably, I'm probably just insulting. Berkeley's a great school. I love Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. Um, but you went, you went for conducting? Yeah. So I, that's, that's a discipline. Yeah. Yeah. Do you play instruments yourself? I did. I was a trombonist. Okay. And I did my undergraduate in trombone performance. And I played double bass. I was not a great double bass player. I was really, I was okay as a double bass player. But while I was working on my bachelor's, I was a trombone performance major. I played double bass. I played a lot of electric bass with bands in those days, which was frowned upon by some, not all, but some of my professors. Um, they thought that was sort of not serious enough. Damn rock and roll. Uh, damn rock and roll. <laughs> I, I couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough rock and roll and R and B. I mean, I was, and I was limited. I was in Toledo, which is right down the road from Detroit. So it was like, I can't get enough of this stuff. <laughs> um, so. I did that. I did all that stuff. I studied a little bit of composition. And then I went to Peabody as a conductor because I started to feel like I had this, this, this moment where I, I was sort of really moving forward very aggressively as a trombonist, but I was getting really frustrated because I felt like I didn't have control of the artistic product. You know, when you're sitting in the back of the orchestra playing, you're not necessarily, you know, in the driver's seat. And I, I spent a lot of my time as a very young kid doing theater. So I really understood or I had this, this innate understanding of that sort of push and pull between directing and book. And I kept conducting little, little things on campus. And one of my professors said, you know, you really have, have a knack for this. You should look at doing more of this. So I thought, really? So I did. I went to st- one studying with uh, a conductor, uh, the conductor of the, the sim- symphony in town, who was then um, one of the conductors at the uh, Edmonton Symphony and also the Royal Ballet at Covent Garden. And I started studying with him. And then I took the auditions for Peabody. And I went there in 1981 as a conducting fellow. In those days, there were only, in my group, there were four of us that were admitted. Out of, I don't know how many hundreds. Right. Why? I was convinced there was no way in God's green earth I was going to get in. I was, when I got the letter, I actually got it. I'm like, yeah, I'll read it. Whatever. <laughs> and I said, I let it sit on my counter. I didn't read it because I'm like, yeah, okay. I'm good. I'll take, I'll, I'll, thank you for applying, but thank you. Thank you. We wish you the, I love that. We wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. And, you know, my roommate said, well, what was the answer? I said, I don't know. I haven't read it yet. He said, well, are you going to read it? I'm like, I, I didn't get it. And he read the letter and I'm like, wow, I got it. How about that? <laughs> so, um, and that's kind of where that part of the journey started. But again, to me, it's very different today than it was then. You know, everybody always says that. So sure. that's, that's kind of well, it's such a cliche, but it was much less friendly in terms of the students. I mean, it was really very hardcore. 
And it was also very rigorous in terms of the performance standards and the classroom standards, not so much. Their goal was to, to, to put you in there, get you ready to go and shoot you out the cannon as a performer who was going to get a, get a job. And, you know, for the most part, they did. They did. That that sort of got me started. And then I my career took some odd turns early on, mainly because um, I sort of discovered that uh, not not every conductor is really comfortable going back and forth between the orchestra and the chorus. To me, I kind of go back and forth seamlessly between chorus, orchestra, singers, orchestra. It's never been something. It's always something I've been very comfortable with. I will. I will say that you know I hate to keep referencing it, but the Paul Schaefer show again when you were conducting that. I mean, you did have the the chorale there. Yeah, well, we brought the women out as well as the, the again. I mean, and you, and you physically were moving about. Yeah, the stage to do yeah. it and, and and handle both of them. Yeah. and everything else. Yeah. And that defined you know the early part of my career, and it it sort of changed the way I did some things, which is which has turned out to be good. That's fantastic. Good. You had mentioned earlier, and I can't remember what the term was, but did you call it a civic ensemble? A, a yeah. civic chorus. Civic chorus. Yeah, and that was sort of the term of art that was used when I was growing up. Civic chorus was basically a big community chorus. It's a big group of people from the community that come together to sing. Okay, so um, these are, these are I mean, they're obviously professional musicians. No, not and, in the chorus. Well, I'm going to say, but professional in the way that they're, that I'm not. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, they're but proficient. They're, they're not paid. Yeah, they're proficient. Um, but what what's interesting is, uh, for instance, I have people. I have uh, some, and this I do this every year, and I'm, I always really try to encourage this. I have people who are super talented, completely green as grass in terms of knowing the technical aspects of what they're doing, but they're very talented and they want to try. So I've got some singers here who beautiful voices. Um, they kind of know what to do. They're not at all comfortable about reading music. And my comment to them was, you know what? The only way to learn to read music is to do it. You just have to get in there and make mistakes and figure it out. And over a period of time, you will become more comfortable. And I've done that so many times over the years. And I have, and in every case, I have never been disappointed in the, in the end because everybody I've done that with has always come out to be super valuable part of the organization. Be able to shine. Yeah. And that's, you know, and everybody's not a soloist. That's the, that's the nice thing about a, a chorus like this. For instance, you know, I have some members of, of the chorale who are true professionals. We had soloists with the Navy Sea Chatters. We had people who have been soloists with uh, other organizations. We have all sorts of people coming from different walks of life. And we have molecular biochemists <laughs> who have retired and engineers who have retired and you know lawyers who are you know getting they're they're tired of going through uh, this is this is what they do this is what they do and this is the endorphin rush and you know it's interesting because the people that come here to rehearse on monday nights wednesday nights you come here and there's really this great feeling you come in here with a hundred some people and you're all working together to do something that's bigger than you are that's fantastic you know and it's great How, what, what, there's no better feeling you got a good job I got a great job. I got a great job. Well, you're, this is not your only gig. No, it's not. I mean, you, you, you know, I followed you on Facebook and, uh, you were out in Toledo with Paul Schaefer and, right. uh, and I'm actually going to be back in Toledo in three, three and a half weeks doing ragtime with Toledo Opera. So what, what holds your attention besides Live Arts Maryland? Well, I have two other in the conducting world. We talk about permanent posts, not full time jobs. Okay. Everybody else talks about a full time job. And in the music world, your job is, full-time plus double overtime sometimes and then other times it's like you're a slacker okay you're not really a slacker but the ebb and flow if you're a musician uh, like a conductor is very extreme so i'm the artistic director here for live arts which includes the chorale and the orchestra and all the other stuff and i'm also the music director and choir master at saint anne's where i've been for quite a while and um my job there is similar but not exactly the same as this job. It's, it's, I basically have to create and drive the, the musical and artistic agenda for the music program at St. Anne's and do it in a way that, you know, I'm hyper uh, conscious of supporting worship with that, with what I do. And then, um, I'm also on the faculty at Washington College. I started teaching there, I guess in 2019. No, it was, or no, it was 2017, 15, 2015. I don't know. And I started teaching there, and my teaching role has expanded. Very cool. Um, 
and um, I've sort of built a small musical theater, music theater program that we're we're sort of trying to to trot out and and they're doing more and more things and it's uh it's it's that's been kind of interesting but the other thing i do is you know my guest conducting and again there are times when my guest conducting is fast and furious and i'm just losing my mind because i'm i've once again said yes too many times and then you're like an actor actors have this point where they they are in this show and they leave this show and they go to the next one and then they go to the next one and then they go to the next one and then all of a sudden they have nothing and they're sitting there weeping into their cornflakes because they're saying, I'm never going to work again. I'm, I'm washed done. up. I'm <laughs> finished. I'm washed up. I'm done. And then two weeks later, they're out working on the next show. And with guest conducting, it's the same way. I, you know, my, there are times where it's very active. I also right now am the uh, music director for uh, the Summer Gilbert Sullivan Productions with the Young Victorian Theater Company in Baltimore, a company I worked with when I first got out of grad school. Oh, wow. And then I left, and then I came back, and then I came back, left again, then I came back, and they asked me to come back a few years ago. So I go up and I do the, the, the main production there. Sounds like a stressful life. It's, yeah, no, it has its moments. You know, it, ha it definitely is stressful. And the trick is, um, you know, I always say to people, you know, the trick to being a musician and working, first of all, I think today, musicians, young musicians, have more options in terms of how they carve out a career than we ever had. I mean, they just, there's so many things you can do, you know, like my daughter graduated from Belmont with a BFA in musical theater. She's teaching at the Nashville theater school. She is auditioning and getting cast in regional productions. She's got other stuff. She's doing some concert work. You know, 30 years ago it would have been, no, you go into straight theater and you do Ipsen. Right, that's it. Right. Don't do Ipsen. You suck. <laughs> Um, my son, who is a guitarist and audio engineer, did the double degree track at Peabody. Last night was here recording when we were doing some punch-ins with the women uh, from the corral on some stuff. And we had some things that were not quite right. We just did some punch-ins after rehearsal. Then he's playing with the punk band that was rehearsing back here. And in the meantime, he plays, uh, he's become one of the first calls uh, in the D.C. theater circuit to play guitar in the pit. So he's just finishing a production of a show at uh, Signature called Private Jones, which is a wonderful show. And then he's got, uh, I think he's going on, I think he's doing hair at Signature. You know, there are a lot of different ways to do it. And to be a musician and, and to stay stay successful and sane, it's got to be time management. You have to figure out, you know, I know that if I'm, if I'm working on music for an upcoming production, I have to start here or I won't get there. Makes sense. Hey, if that envelope, when you open it finally on your, uh, your desktop there said, dear Mr. Green, thank you for your application. We wish you future endeavors. Where, where would uh, Ernie Green be today? Well, you know, it, that's a funny question. My father, who, who passed away a few years ago, always had it in my mind, his mind that I was going to come and work for him. He was a manufacturer's rep. He did uh, architectural hardware. And um, he was trying to figure out what he was going to do with the company. It was a very small company, but a company that he had built and the consultant CC that he had built. And he was convinced that I was going to come and work and take that over and just, you know, I was going to take it on. And I think it took him a while to be okay with the fact that I was a crazy musician and not taking on a responsible <laughs> job. But it's funny, I, you know, I have friends who I pose the same question to. There's got to be some kind of oddity in my life that I've never looked back and I've never really thought about that in any kind of detail. And I'm not sure why. Or if I have thought about it, I haven't been able to come up with anything other than, yeah, I don't know, I guess I would have flipped burgers or something. Oh, it sounds like there, there was an innate drive. Yeah, or just, you know, and I think there's also something to be said. There was probably a little bit of the hubris of youth, you know, that I was convinced that I was going to end up you know, doing something like this. And uh, it just ended up, I, I've, like I said, I've been very lucky. And I, you know, you, you work hard. People always talk about musical geniuses uh, like Mozart, who came easy to. Mozart also worked really hard. Nothing comes easy. Nothing comes easy. <laughs> and it, you got to put the time in. That's absolutely true. Who is on your bucket list? I mean, you have worked with some of the greats. What individual or maybe it's an entity Ooh. would you like to collaborate with? Wow. Like, it would be extraordinary to conduct for somebody like, in the popular world, like Streisand. You know, that would really be pretty extraordinary. Um, I had 
sort of tangential connections with her through Marvin because they were childhood friends. Mm-hmm. They grew up together. Uh, Marvin was her conductor for a long time, but I was Marvin's conductor. So I had that connection. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I absolutely love my work with Paul. And, um, you know, to get to work with like, but usually when we do this gossip with Paul, I'm working with Valerie Simpson, who's like a Motown legend. Right. And there's nothing about that that stinks, you know? Yeah. So for me, it's, it's more about not the, not so much the person. For me, it's about the project. It's like, what do I want to do next? And for me, it's always, you know, let's find the next project that, that sort of makes you go, Ooh, Ooh, that could be fun. Or what if we did this? Awesome. Well, how can we support Live Arts Maryland? Okay, the obvious thing is come to the shows. Come to the shows. I always tell people, you know, and, and I actually, I sort of joke about it. I should get like a cut from the symphony, the ballet, and the opera in addition to Live Arts because I always tell people whenever I speak at a public event, I always say, go see some live music, go see the chorale, the ballet, the opera, the symphony. And I always plug everybody equally. Because I really feel like um, that idea of the rising tide lifts all ships. And it does. It really and truly does. So if you go to a concert, if you go to a performance and you like it, realize that when you go to a concert, chances are your ticket is only paying for 50% of what you just saw. In what we call the art music world, the non-Rams head, non-pop music world. When you're in the art music world for reasons that, still escape me after how many decades doing this <laughs> our ticket prices are scaled so that ticket prices basically make up 50 percent or less of what it costs to build the product so if you like something give a little extra money if you bought a 50 dollar ticket you know what give 50 dollars more you know at the end of the year just, the end of the year, just, just 50 dollars that's what 10 starbucks maybe yeah when you when you boil it down yeah. It's it's not much for the experience yeah. that you got. And and you know, think about the fact that by doing that, you could make a mark on the on the, the community and uh the organization really easy. It's not hard. Well you can arts does keep the community alive. Oh, absolutely. Um, you, you know, and whether you're standing there looking at a painting and scratching your chin or yeah. listening to something yeah. or making something with your hands. Yeah. Art is just so integral to what we have. And certainly I think absolutely. during COVID that we probably learned a little bit of that. Yeah, uh, we everybody took up a new hobby. And, right. You know, and well, and the arts during COVID, you know, I, I, I say this at my own peril, but I had this conversation the other day and I said to somebody, you know, I kind of miss the quiet of the pandemic because when it was quiet and we were having to figure out, like, how do you get a bunch of singers not to be a super spreader event? <laughs> right. As they're all like sailing, you know, and I mean, singing is like a big super spreader event. And so how do you get singers to do that safely? And what I miss is the quiet that was sort of inherent in the isolation, because what that meant is that when you actually had a performance, it was a bigger deal. I can see that. I think we got very casual and we took a lot of stuff for granted. We took a lot of stuff for, you know, oh, we're going to see the the, the chorale, the opera, the symphony, the ballet. I think we took that stuff for granted. I think we took live performance for granted in a way that we hadn't before. And I think with the quiet, all of a sudden you have a performance and it's, it's special. It's important. Well, we need to make it special and important every day. Again, again, every day. Liveartsmd.org is where you want to go. You can check out the remaining bit of the season. Yeah, it we've ends got some in June. Cool stuff, yeah. Uh, it'll kick up again, I guess, in the fall. September. We start off, uh, we actually may be doing something in August. That's, that's still TBD, but we're getting ready to launch the next season. But keep your eye out because they're doing so much fun things. And if you're at the mall, stop by. Yeah. And if you hear us singing, and just come on in. Come on in. And if you have a good voice. Come we'll on stand in line with everybody else. And sing. Yeah, and sing. yeah. We, you know, it's it's. Yeah, I love it when people come in and just hang out and listen to us rehearse. Fantastic. Well, you've got plenty of opportunities to do it. I want to thank you, Ernie Green, so much for your thank time, you. Thank and you so thank much. you for what you've done to the community and for the arts community for all these decades. And uh, hopefully, uh, keep on doing it. You got it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's local business spotlight. Please make sure to visit ionanapolis.net for all your local news, events, and opinion. And in case you haven't already, please subscribe to the Ion Annapolis Daily News Brief, where we bring you all the day's local news direct to your phone, tablet, or computer in about 10 minutes. 
It comes to you at 6 a.m. every Monday through Friday, and you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.